in the number two level. And I doubt if any of the Islamic satellites yet have such camera like the one we have in Malaysia. And I remember when I bought these cameras, these were the best cameras available. It wasn't available in Malaysia, so we had to import from Japan. And, and Sony told me we don't have such cameras anywhere in Malaysia. So when I, first time when I interviewed Abdul Hadi and appointed him for the job, he's supposed to be a very experienced cameraman in Malaysia. When he saw the cameras, he ran away. <coughs> he resigned, he said, such camera, such big stand that I've never seen in my life. And believe me, send me a text message, I love you Dr. Zakir, but I cannot handle any resign. So I told him, don't worry, come back, Allah is there with us, and I will teach you. And in the next few days, few weeks, Alhamdulillah, I taught him about the few things which he wasn't aware of, these high-end cameras. And, mashallah, he became an expert, and I could say that he was one of the best cameramen available in Malaysia, handling the best cameras. But Allah has his own reason. And, and unfortunately, he, uh, he had to leave this world, it was Allah's will. And we accept the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But yet, the husband told me, no problem, I will try and do it alone. And single-handedly, with the help of some person getting him the standard, etc. So we again restarted this program. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if there's a will, there's a way. And Allah's help is there. Imagine in Bombay we had, we had directors, we had director of photography, we had cameraman, we had set designers. Here everyone, mashallah, everything is Allah's help. Because the experience that are in the field of Dawah, I am all in one. The director, uh, the director of photography, the art designer, the sets that you've seen, everything with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a misconception that you require too many staff to do dawah, you require a big budget, yes, alhamdulillah. In 2016, we were the largest private Muslim dawah organization in the world, having more than 650 employees, having the biggest budget in the world. Now our budget has come down to 10%, yet it may be one of the largest budget. Imagine in our head office here in Malaysia, we have only one technical staff and two security, yet we are continuing. So, the number one important factor for dawah is the help of Allah. And when we did hijrah, me and my family from Bombay to Putraja in Malaysia, our dawah increased, our iman increased, our activity increased, the Facebook following is now, mashallah, it was, it was less than 14 million, now it is, mashallah, more than 23 million. It has increased by 75 percent. My YouTube was only 400,000, now it is 3.6 million subscribers. Imagine, nearly nine times more. And we just started our Instagram and recently, hardly about three months ago, we got the blue tick. For the first two years, the Instagram, or maybe two and a half years, didn't give us the blue tick. Finally, one of my friends, he used his influence and we were able to get the blue tick. And the moment we got the blue tick, the followers increased. And just two days back, mashallah, we crossed more than a million followers on the Instagram. And we hope that inshallah, in the next few years, inshallah, it should reach close to the followers or maybe outnumber the followers of the Facebook, inshallah. All the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, numbers are not important. It's important that the message reaches the world and the message is implemented by the people. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all, I mean, the life has been so good with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many people tell me, oh, you have done hijrah, the life has changed completely. Believe me. Everything Allah gave us on a red carpet. If we try to take out false, you can take out a million problems. But if you think of the niyama Allah has given, it is billions times more. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been very kind in this time that after we did hijrah and we left all our, all our staff and our assets, everything in Bombay and we restarted here, Allah has been very kind and has been has been very helpful to us, that increased activity. And the reason that I stayed a bit longer in Qatar was because my third child, that is my daughter Rujda, mashallah, about two months ago, on the 10th of May, she got married. As you may be aware that my son Fari got married in last Ramadan, one year, few months ago, along with my daughter. And now my third child, we have three children, that's my second daughter, Rujda, 
Mashallah, she also finally got married on the 10th of May, about two months and few days ago. So one of my major responsibilities as a father, including my wife as a mother, we have fulfilled one of the major responsibilities that all our three children have got married and we tried to get the best spouse that we could find for them so that, inshallah, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that made the progeny, made the children of our children and the generations to come would be like Ibrahim al salam prays that they be Muslim and may they spread the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may they be, they may, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them instrumental in delivering his message throughout the world. So due to this factor, there was a gap and inshallah, I will be in Malaysia for another two and a half months. So inshallah, I'll be handling this session that's going on. And Farik next week would be traveling to Makkah and Medina. He has a Dawah training program he's conducting five days in Medina and five days in Makkah. Then he may spend a few days in Riyadh. So he, so he has a two weeks trip from after a week. So he'll not be handling the next session, Ashraq Farik. There'll be a gap. And when he comes back, he'll be coming again on Saturday. So he'll miss that. So I'll be handling, this is the third Saturday I'll be handling. And the fifth Saturday normally supposed to be a rest day. It takes place every once every three months. But I decided since we missed some of the sessions, Inshallah, the fifth Saturday of this month, July, I'll be handling Ask Sheikh, Ask Dr. Zakir. So in this month, I missed the first Saturday due to the absence of the staff. So we'll compensate by having the session on the fifth Saturday, which is normally a rest day. Every three months, there's one, one Saturday, which is a rest Saturday. But Inshallah, so two weeks from now, that is on the 22nd of today is the 15th so on the 29th of July I'll be handling Ask Dr. Zakir uh, season 11 session 2 and again next month the first Saturday and the third Saturday will be handled by me and Farik would be missing the fourth Saturday of July as well as the second Saturday of July then again he'll be here for one week and he'll be going again to Indonesia for a lecture tour, again for about maybe 10 days. So I think he will be outside Malaysia more than me. I'm for about six months, maybe he'll be for seven or seven and a half months. And my last month that I accept his efforts in the field of Dawa. So I'll try and finish my six sessions because each season is for six sessions. So I'll have two sessions in July the third and the fifth Saturday, two sessions in August, the first and the third Saturday, and inshallah, in September, the first and third Saturday, that is the second and the 16th of September. And after that, I'll be traveling. I've got some few lecture tours. Since the pandemic is over, I'll be traveling to various countries, I've got invitation from several countries. So those countries which I feel are more fruitful for Dawa, I'll be traveling. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may accept my efforts. So this was just a small description for the, for the break in the sessions, the live sessions of myself and my son. We start with open question and session. We'll take more questions from the WhatsApp. And as you're aware that every week for my session, we receive more than 5,000 questions on the WhatsApp and live a few thousand on the Facebook and a few thousand on the YouTube. So total we receive about 20,000 questions. The live questions, the question that come on the WhatsApp is, is seen by my staff. They may not go through all the 5,000 questions. They may go to 2,000 questions or plus. Out of which 100 questions they select and send it to me. From that, I select about 15 questions which I intend to reply in the session. And simultaneously, there are my staff, there's my son, who's checking the questions that are posted on the Facebook and YouTube live. So the questions on the YouTube and Facebook, which are live, are checked by my staff and they forward it onto my phone because if I start reading the questions, it will be too long. So from the selected questions which they send, I glance through them 
and I pick up those questions also. The most of the questions are from the WhatsApp, few are from the Facebook and YouTube, and maybe sometimes from the other social media. So we start with the first question from WhatsApp. Assalamu alaikum alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Asim Shahid Golap from Mumbai, India. I am a lawyer by profession and I appear in various courts of law. My question is, generally the lawyers address the judges as my lord or your lordship. Is it permitted to address in that manner when Aniya isn't of considering them as Lord. This is a very important question asked by the Asim from Mumbai, India that can we call in the court of law we refer to the judges as my Lord. So can we call my Lord and we know that we don't consider them to be God. So though we don't consider them to be God, can we call them Lord? First you should understand that what is the meaning of the word Lord. The English word Lord has various meanings. One of the meaning is God. And but natural in no way can you refer God to anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Except the one true God Allah. You cannot refer Rabb or God or Lord to anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Lord has various other meanings also. The word Lord in England is also used as a title. Like there are various titles given to people like knight, they also title as sir. So lord is an honorific title or a title of honor given to any man and it's a common in English language. So one of the meanings of lord is God, the other meaning is calling him with honor or with respect like sir. The third meaning of lord is also that in the UK parliament there is a house of commons and the upper house of parliament. The upper house of the UK parliament is called as a house of lords. So if you are a member of the upper house of parliament you are called as lord. So anyone who is a member of upper house of parliament in UK is called a lord. No one considers him to be god. So lord in English language has various meanings. One more meaning in UK the judges of the high court or the judges of the court of appeal are referred to as lord me lord or my lord so this is the title given to the judges of the high court in uk or the court of appeal and various courts in the world they follow the british system like in india also we follow the british system of law so the judges are called as my lord or lordship similarly in malaysia and various other countries in the world the judges are called as Lord. So when you are referring to the judge as Lord, it is the title of honor. No one refers to him as God. So one of the meaning of the word Lord in English language is God. The other meaning is for respect, like sir. The other meaning is if you are a member of the upper house of parliament in UK, you are called a Lord. Or if you are a judge of a court of law, you are called a Lord. So when in the court of law, the lawyer refers to the judge as my lord or if the witness referred to the judge as my lord is perfectly fine no one refers to them as god so this is the title given to the judges in the court of law and there's no problem at all but if you consider them to be god it's totally haram it is shirk no human being can be considered as god so if you are referring to lord as a title or as honor instead of sir or for respect or to the judges as a title there is no problem at all, it's perfectly alright in Islam, but natural. You cannot refer to anyone as God or except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that answers the question. <clears throat> the next question. Assalamu alaikum. 
wa alaikum assalam may allah bless you i have another question on late fee alhamdulillah allah gave you knowledge and health to answer these questions in one of your video you said that late fee money on money is haram now i just wanted to know is late fee in a library for delaying returning of the book taken is halal or haram jazakallah khair may allah bless you and give you better life in this world and especially in the hereafter a similar question is asked by another person assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh i am asif kazi from mumbai india is it permissible to charge a late fee for delaying the payment of school fees or rent of an apartment can we sign contracts in which is stipulated a late fee at the percentage of 1% of the rent per month or something similar and take care that we will not make the payment late thus not involving in interest or riba the question asked by the brother this the first question is that i had said that late fee is haram so if you return a book late in the library are we allowed is it permitted to charge late fee can we give late fee and a similar question is asked by person that can a school if we delay the school in payment of the school fees can the school charge late fee and is it permitted in islam or a rent of an apartment if we pay it later than the due date can the owner of the apartment charge late fee is it islamically permitted as far as charging a late fee if the payment is delayed for example if there is a school fee which has to be paid by the 10th of every month and if the school says that if you pay after the 10th of the month you have to pay a late fee of 100 rupees or 50 rupees or 2 dollars or 5 dollars this is not permitted in islam it will be counted as riba if you delay any payment and for that you charge additional money it is nothing but riba and it is haram it is islamically a haram contract a school cannot charge late fee just because of delayed payment or if you are paying the rent of an apartment and the due date is 5th of a month and if you delay by one week and if the contract says that if you delay by one week you have to pay so much percentage 1% of the of the rent or per month or you pay a fee this is money paid for the money given late for delayed payment is nothing but riba it's money on money it's haram but natural in a contract where payment has to be given for the rent of an apartment or for school fees you can be strict on a due date if it's delayed you can put conditions like okay it will not allowed or you can stop him from entering attending school but you cannot charge extra money because he paid money late it is riba it's haram so in the earlier answer i don't know which answer you're referring to if it's charging late fee for delayed school fees it is haram what you can do is you can tell okay if you if you pay a late fee late you will not be allowed to attend school that's permissible but you cannot charge a late fee this is not permitted in islam and i'm aware that if you don't charge late fee the person will not pay what are you going to do and we had this problem in india when we had a school and we used to say that okay if you don't pay then there's a reminder sent one week late then two weeks late then one month late the person doesn't know what going to do so unfortunately we can say okay your child may not be allowed to attend school which is not what we want to but if it's too many weeks or months delayed you can't stipulate it but you cannot charge extra fee because it's money on money given late which is riba it's haram so late fee cannot be given late fee cannot be charged or a penalty cannot be charged in money for any money which is given late this is islamically not permitted but regarding a question that if i am taking a book on rent from a library and if i delay in returning can he charge a late fee yes or if he is charging you 1 dollar per book per week and if you give it late he can charge you additional rent that's permitted or if he is selling that you take the book free but if you return 
After one week, I'll charge you. That is permitted. He is not charging money for the money giving late. But if you are renting a product, and if you delay in giving the rent, and if he is charging you additional rent, it's permitted. He cannot charge you a late fee for the money given late. That is riba. But if he is charging you extra because you are delaying in giving the book back, which is on rent. So if you are hiring a book from a library, one dollar a week, or one dollar for two weeks. And if you delay in returning and he charges you more rent, it's permitted. He's charging you more rent because you're renting for a longer period. For example, if you rent a car for five days and you take it for another two days, you cannot say that I'll not charge you. He'll charge you additional rent for hiring the car for two more days. That's permitted. But if you hire the car for five days and you say I will not, and you return back the car after five days and say I will give the money after one week, then charging more is haram. But if he takes the car for a longer period, like you ask, if you delay in returning the book, he can charge you extra rent because you have rented the book for a longer period. But charging a late fee just because you have given the rent late, like of an apartment, that is not permitted. Hope it's clear. So signing a contract also saying that you will give extra money if you pay late is also a haram contract. So in this thing, you have to be careful that you have to change the words of a contract in such a way that it does not involve riba. But unfortunately, most of the contracts that are there in most parts of the world, even in Muslim country, unfortunately, have this clause of late fee, if you pay late, etc., which is not Islamically correct. So Muslim, having such a contract, if you are the owner of a of an apartment, if you rent an apartment and you put the clause that if you give late, you'll have to pay extra money, it's haram, you cannot make a contract, neither can you make such a contract for renting your apartment, neither can you sign a contract if you're renting the apartment somewhere else. But unfortunately, what has happened that there are certain, there are many countries in the world where even the government says that if you pay the telephone bill late, you have to pay a late fee. Or if you pay the electricity bill, you have to pay late fee. So these contracts, you have no option of changing. If it's a private contract, see to it, you change it. And that's what we do. We change the words of the contract. But if it's a government contract, it's not possible that the government will change the contract for you if you're a Muslim. So in such cases, the Fuqah has said that though it's a haram contract, where you may have to pay a late fee for giving electricity late, see to it that you don't give it late. See to it, you don't pay the electricity of the government late or pay for the telephone bill late. Pay it on time and don't indulge in giving a late fine. Yet, signing the contract is yet not permitted, but the Fuqah say you ask forgiveness from Allah because you cannot, it is a zarorat, it's a requirement for you to take electricity and that comes from the government or from a company which is not willing to change. So in this case, there are the last resort in such contracts you can sign, yet it is wrong and you ask forgiveness from Allah and see to it that you don't delay and you pay on time and you ask forgiveness from Allah and inshallah Allah will forgive you. But charging late fee for late payment Islamically is not permitted in Islam. And signing such contracts also, if it's for personal contracts of renting a flat, which the person see to it that you draft the contract as per the Sharia laws. It's difficult, but it's possible. It's difficult. You have to convince them. You have to give them this. You can say put more stricter clause that if I delay in payment once or twice, you can kick me out of the apartment, no problem. Put clause which are more strict, but putting a clause which involves riba is haram. Hope they answer the question. The next question, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi Shafiq Khan from London, UK. I'm a businessman. Can we use a credit card of a conventional bank based on interest and take care that we always pay the amount before due date and thus not involve in Rabah? 
regarding using a credit card of a conventional bank which is based on interest on riba and ensuring that when we use a credit card if you give within a period of 29 days to 59 days they don't charge you interest so if we take care that we will pay on time and we will not give a single penny interest is it permitted to use credit card according to the strict focahas and the strict scholars they have said signing a contract in which you say that if i default in the payment i will pay an interest whether it be 2% a month or 3% a month which is normally the case in credit card it's very high it's 2 3% sometimes 4% a month which is exorbitant signing a contract even though you pay on time it is haram and Sheikh Ibn Taymin was asked this question. He said, "Signing a contract in which there is a clause of riba, even if you pay on time, is not permitted. It is a haram contract and should not be indulged in such a contract." As I said in my earlier answer, even using credit cards, the major scholars, the authentic scholars who are strict on Quran and Sunnah, they say using a credit card of a conventional bank is haram, even if you pay on time. Point number one. by signing the contract that if you default you will pay interest is you agreeing with the terms of riba which is haram and the hadith of the prophet is very clear that the person giving riba the person taking riba the person who is a witness and person who arranges it all are the same and it is haram and allah clearly mentioned in eight different places that about riba And Allah clearly mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter two, verse number two seventy-eight, and verse number two seventy-nine, that if you give up not your demands of riba, then take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. So riba, it is the twelfth major sin, according to Imam Dhabi in his book, the Kabair, the major sins. He puts riba as the twelfth major sin, and it is like waging a war against Allah and His Rasul. There are many major sins. Even drinking alcohol is a major sin. But Allah doesn't say that if you drink alcohol or if you do zina, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. As far as riba is concerned, Allah is explicit in Surah Baqarah, chapter two, verse two seventy-eight and two seventy-nine, that if you involve, if if you involve in riba, if you give up not your demands of riba, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. And which human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, can wage a war against Allah and his rasul so when you sign a contract that is the reason even keeping a savings account in a conventional bank which deal with riba is haram because even though you say that i will keep the money in a savings account or in a fixed deposit and what money i get i'll give in charity the quran is clearly taking interest is haram so for giving in charity first you have to take Taking interest is haram. Giving interest is haram. Signing as a witness or facilitating, even signing for a conventional bank account as a witness or introducer to your friend is haram. So all these are haram. So in a credit card, what many people I know, there are fatwas given by many so-called European scholars and you know fatwa committee of of. Uh, Of the Western countries of North America, of America, I know many. Okay, because it's a zarwa, you can use a credit card as long as you pay on time. There are high chances that you may forget. If number one, signing a contract, even if you pay on time, is haram. Number one, number two, who knows about the future? Can it not be possible that once in a while you may forget? And what the clause of the credit card is that after you use the money, you have to pay within. 30 days can be extended to 59 days depending upon the bank so minimum time period they give is 30 days can be up to 59 days depending which part of the month do you take and if you pay on time they give you free and they charge you a annual fee for using the credit card now annual fee for using money on in itself is haram so number one signing the contract is haram taking an annual fees for giving money on riba that's haram and third if you don't pay on time that is haram so if you don't pay on time however much you may be confident there are time that you may forget 
there are times that you may be sick and you may not be on time. So even if it has happened once in few years, it's a grave major sin. Allah and Rasul wage a war against you. So first of all, even if you pay on time, it's haram because you're signing a contract. Number two, you're paying the annual fees for credit card. That itself is haram. Number three, that if you forget, actually you'll be paying riba. So all three are haram. I know that there are some Western countries, scholars who say, Zaru, what is the Zaruwat? Don't indulge in it. You keep a debit card. Debit card is permitted. If you have to have a bank account, you can open a current account which does not involve in riba. You can't take riba and give it in charity. Some scholars say it's okay, but the most of them, these scholars, taking itself is haram. So for giving first, you have to take. So I disagree with Muslims keeping in a conventional bank in a fixed deposit or saving the account and saying we'll give the riba in charity, thinking we'll get no sabab. No, that itself is wrong. Because when you're taking riba, you're already getting a major sin. By charity, you may be getting 100 points plus, but taking riba, you may be getting 10,000 points negative. So 10,000 negative, 100 positive, yet you have 9,900 negative points. What is the benefit? But because of the rewards, you can open in a conventional bank in a current account which does not involve riba. If you want to use a card, you can very well use a debit card. Debit card means if there is account in the money, the money can be utilized. Here you are not taking a loan from the bank. So debit card is permitted, credit card in a conventional bank is prohibited. So the alternative you can do is use a debit card. See to do put money in the bank if you have to use a card. And when there is money, whatever money you have, that much money you can use, whether for shopping, whether for payments of bill, no problem. If it's an Islamic bank working on Islamic principles and not on riba, then you can use a credit card of Islamic bank because the Sharia is not broken. It does not deal with riba. It is based on the Islamic principles of Sharia without involving riba. So if you have a credit card of a Islamic bank working on the principles of Sharia, then that's permitted. But best, I would say, is don't take loan even from Islamic bank. Best is not to take loan. You can have partnership, you can do musharaka with your friends, etc. Best is not to take a loan from any bank. If you have to take as a last resort, better take from Islamic bank than a conventional bank. Don't use credit card of any bank. If you have to use a last resort, use of Islamic bank, okay. Best is to use the debit card. Hope that answers the question. We have on the YouTube, Maitabuddin, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salaam, Malhanda, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salaam, Vili Nusantara from Indonesia, Wa Alaikum Salaam, Zayed, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salaam, Muhammad Rabbikbul Hassan, Kia Idris, Muhammad, Muhammad Maruf Billah, Uzma Akmal, Shahid Sheikh, Mahi Sheikh, Shaykat Nishad, Irfan Riyan, Desi Gimmer, Momin Shodiev, Sir Whitemead, Nadia Khatak, Mahi Shahik, Bilawal, Asha Mani, Rizwan Sayyid, all of them are wishing Salaam Walaikum Salaam, they are praying for me, I pray for you too. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the best in this fall and the akhirah. On the Facebook you have Ashraful Islam. Naeem, Nawab Dadu, Abdul Yusuf, Muhammad Rayyan, Ahmadullah, Jangir Ikram, Berkezai Oman, Abu Bakr Siddiq, Lili Rifki, Momin Muhammad, Samsur Rahman, Muhammad Firdos from Bangladesh, A. Gauri, Safar Ali, J.N. Farooq, Muhammad Imran, Ahmad Shafaq, Habib Ansari, Nauman, Nauman, 
عبد العزیز سعد جمع وسیم اکرم السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام میں اللہ سبحانہ تعالیٰ گیو یو دا بیسٹ ان دس والا ہے والا داخرہ The question posed from the YouTube is Rizwan, from Rizwan Sayyid. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Is it permissible to work in an Islamic bank and can you recommend some Islamic bank in Dubai? As far as Islamic banking is concerned, the Islamic banking is based on the Sharia principles, on the Islamic principles of finance and though I'm aware that at a higher level, somewhere or the other, because the system of riba is so much engrossed, you cannot be 100% perfect. But as I mentioned in my earlier answer, as a last resort, best is not to take loan. If you have to take, better take from Islamic bank and don't take from a conventional bank. Similarly, if you have to work in a conventional bank, working in a conventional bank based on riba, based on interest is haram on any post whether it be a post of a manager or a post of an accountant or post of a clerk, even as a watchman, as a security guard, it's haram. Because if the major activity of the company is haram, whether it's an alcoholic company, company producing alcohol or an interest-based riba or a financial institute based on riba or a shop selling pork, if the major activity is haram, working in any position in that company is haram. So working in a conventional bank, working in a conventional bank in any post is haram. But working in Islamic bank is permitted. And in the UAE, as far as my knowledge goes, there are six Islamic banks in UAE. First there were seven, now it became six. And one of the biggest bank is the Dubai Islamic Bank. The second in terms of volume and big, it's the Emirates Islamic Bank. Then you have the Abu Dhabi Islamic Bank. You have the Sharjah Islamic Bank. You have the Ajman Islamic Bank. And you have the Rak Islamic Bank, the six banks. There was a Noor Islamic Bank, but that closed down and it merged with the Dubai Islamic Bank. So basically there are six Islamic banks in UAE. And there are branches in different parts of UAE, in Dubai, in Sharjah, in Abu Dhabi. So the biggest is the Dubai Islamic Bank, I repeat. Number two is the Amin Islamic Bank. Then the Abu Dhabi Islamic Bank, Sharjah Islamic Bank, Ajman Islamic Bank, and the Rak Islamic Bank, Ras al Khaimah. There are six Islamic banks. And if you want working in Islamic Bank based on the Shara principle, is permitted. Hope that answers the question. There is a question from YouTube, Rasmitha Koka. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brother. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How to suggest to non-Muslims who are afraid to accept Islam because of society and relationship fear, how can we motivate them? The question posed is that if a non-Muslim who likes Islam and wants to practice Islam but is afraid of the society, how can we encourage them? How can we support them? As far as, as if a non-Muslim is afraid of the society and is fearful that he may have a backlash, number one, if a person accepts Islam, he doesn't have to proclaim to the world. If a man or a woman, a male or a female, a boy or a girl who is a non-Muslim, who is convinced with the teaching of Islam, who believes that there is only one God and believes that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God, it is between them and Allah. If they tell to themselves and they agree that there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, they don't have to proclaim to the world. It is between them and Allah. As long as they believe in their heart that there is one God who deserves worship and there is no other God besides Allah 
and they believe that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of that Allah, it is sufficient, they are Muslims. But proclaiming is better so that it, it helps them, so that people come to know they are Muslims and they can practice, they can ask the Muslims, they can go to the mosque, they can ask them if there are problems, they can ask them if there are difficulty and will help them a lot. But if the situation is such that they are living in a country, a non-Muslim country, or there may be a country where the non-Muslim may fear that his relatives may get violent, their life is in danger. In these cases, they can keep about the Islamic faith as a secret. It's permitted. Till the time it is convenient for them to proclaim. So in such cases, till the time they feel they can settle or they can find a place where they can stay or if they feel that the parents will go against them so they wait, they don't proclaim, they can accept Islam and wait till the time is convenient or when they can do hijra or they can convince their parents that what they have done is right and if they are convinced so depending upon the situation they can keep it secret for few days or few weeks or a few months and reveal it at the right time or do hijra or convince their parents, convince their relatives, it's permitted. Now those people are fearful, it's the duty of the Muslims to make them comfortable. We should see to it that we, if we feel that keeping it a secret is better, you can help them to keep it a secret and support them. And if you feel that it's the best that they do hijra and proclaim it, they can do hijra, they can change their place of residence and go to a majority Muslim area and it is the duty of us Muslims to support them. So depending upon what is the requirement for the revert, accordingly should support. If we feel that the life is in danger and proclaiming is detrimental, you can keep it a secret. But this is very in very rare cases, maybe one or two percent of the people accepting Islam. In majority, maybe the parents may feel offended but it's not a question of life and death. So in these cases, you, they should try and convince their parents what they have done is, is right. And it's the, it's the duty of us Muslims to see to it that we give them support. And I always say that when a non-Muslim accepts Islam, when a non-Muslim accepts Islam, one of the Muslim brothers should see to it that he makes him like a brother, a family member, at least for the first few months he accepts Islam. So we recommend that one Muslim, if a Muslim, if a non-Muslim man accepts Islam, then one of the Muslims should consider, okay, form for the next few months at least you are like my brother. And invite him to his family so that he can spend the eat together, he can spend the good times and the sorrowful times, as though he has a family. And he spends time with him, guides him. If it's a lady who accepts Islam, so a Muslim can make her her sister. You know, so at least for the few months when they accept Islam, see to it that you go out of the way and share the pleasure like you do with any other family member. So either you spend together, you guide them, call them home, teach them about the salah, about the details of the Islamic Sharia and see to it that they are comfortable. So that if they go to a mosque and if they go with a Muslim, they are more comfortable rather than going alone to a mosque and you, may know, know, you don't know what will happen. So if you have a Muslim friend accompanying you who behaves like a brother, it's much so, it's very important that when a non-Muslim accepts Islam, some of the Muslim should treat them like family members at least for the first few weeks or first few months till the things are better. And of course, by the time he'll have more friends. So once he is experienced in being a Muslim for a few months or a year, then it becomes easier and more comfortable more comfortable for him to travel amongst the Muslims or to be among the Muslims. So when a non-Muslim accepts Islam, see to it that the Muslims support them. Many times you may have to support financially, morally and various other ways. And if the non-Muslim is fearful, see to it that you support, that there is someone who is there. If something happens at the last moment, they can give you a call and surely you can be there present in the next few minutes or in 20 minutes, whatever it is. So this gives a sense of security and would be easier for non-Muslim to accept Islam. Hope that answers the question.
क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम द यूट्यूब देसी ग्रामर प्रोमैक्स असलम को सर इज इट हराम फॉर अ मैन टू वेयर चेन नॉट गोल्ड चेन As far as wearing a chain is concerned, maybe a neck chain. Is it haram if not gold? As far as for a man to wear gold, there is a clear-cut hadith in the Prophet that the gold and silver is haram for the Muslim man. So wearing gold or or silver, whether sorry, gold and silk is haram. So wearing a gold ring or a gold. bracelet or a gold chain it's haram for the man even wearing silk is haram but this is permitted for the women the question is is wearing a chain which is not made of gold maybe made of silver or any other metal is it permitted or not there is another hadith of the prophet which clearly says that you cannot wear things that pertains to the opposite sex so wearing things which are meant particularly for females a man cannot wear and things which are meant for the male a female cannot wear so this is a broad hadith that anything which is meant for particularly a female a male cannot wear and what is particularly meant for a male a female cannot wear for example uh things that are there like a earring a earring is usually meant for a female so a male cannot wear a earring a ring a ring is worn both by male and by female so wearing a ring is permitted and the prophet wore a ring the prophet wore a silver ring so wearing a ring is meant for the female also meant for the male also so wearing a ring is permitted but wearing a gold ring is not talking about a finger ring so wearing a gold ring is not permitted for the male but is permitted for a female but wearing a silver ring is permitted for both so if the ring a finger ring if it's not made of gold it's permitted for the male coming to a neck chain as far as the neck chain is concerned it is a sign it is mainly worn by female so if you see the fatwas of most of the scholars they will say wearing a neck chain is prohibited for a male because it meant for the female but what you should realize that previously all the centuries before i do agree that necklace or a neck chain was primarily worn by the female but in the last few decades we find that it is also worn by the male now is it permitted for a male to wear something of, of which is specially meant for the female and the answer is no but there may be certain times certain things in which it is meant for a particular sex gender later on it may be used for both and the best example i can give you is of a wrist watch the watch when it was introduced earlier in the 16th century when the watch was introduced the wrist watch was only meant for the female the male never wore wrist watch what the male wore was a coat watch you know they took out from the inner coat pocket and this sort so if in the 16th and 17th century if a islamic scholar was asked can a man wear wrist watch and the answer would be no because wrist watch was only meant by females only worn by females many people may not be aware of the history of the wrist watch it was in the 18th century or rather towards 1880 or the early later part of the 19th century about 250 years after the wrist watch was invented it was 1880 or 1780 or the 1880 it was the soldiers they could not afford keeping a watch in the coat because to take out a watch you your 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 hand was utilized so soldiers when they wanted to time if they were had an operation or had any any event or any attack to be done they they had to be precise in time so imagine if you had a gun in hand and then if you had a weapon in hand then you are keeping the weapon down and taking out from your coat was very impractical so 
in 1880s or 1780s, the soldiers started wearing a wristwatch. That was in the 18th century. You know, so the wristwatch came in the early part of the 16th century, towards the latter part of the 18th century, maybe 250 years. Till 250 years, men never wore wristwatches. It was meant only for female. Later on, in the early part of the 19th century, men started wearing wristwatches. In the end of the 19th century, it became common that the men wear wristwatch. In the 20th and 21st century, more men wear wristwatch than females. If you do a survey, the percentage of men wearing wristwatch is higher than the female wearing wristwatch. So today, if you ask an Islamic scholar, can men wear wristwatch? I don't know of any Islamic scholars which say that wristwatch cannot be worn by men. But if you go back in history, maybe in the 16th century or 17th century, if you had asked Islamic scholar, can men wear wristwatch? And the answer would be no. Because it was meant specifically for female. As times changed after 250 years, the men started wearing. And now, more men wear than women. If you ask me, can men wear wristwatch? Of course they can wear. No scholar that I know of ever said wristwatch is haram. Now, as far as the chain is concerned, the trend of men wearing chain has increased. Now you find a large percentage, not majority, but quite a large percentage, maybe 10%, 20% of the men, they wear chain. Depending upon which part of the world you come from, in certain countries, majority of the male wear chain. But if you look all over the world, Previously, men used to wear very rarely now, yet you have a substantial percentage, whether it's 10% or 20% or more, I don't know. But yet, now the trend has started that men are wearing chain. And even the chain, the type of chain the men wear is completely different than the type of chain the female wear. The men wear much thicker chain. It is bigger as compared to female. The female necklaces are thin. They are delicate, even if they are bigger, it, is, it has got a particular design. So the moment you look at a necklace of a female, you can identify different than a male, easily. So I know that if you read fatwas, almost all the scholars in the past, whether it be Sheikh bin Baz or Sheikh Utaymi or Nasr Dalbani or most of the scholars, if you see the fatwas, are men allowed to wear neck chain? And they'll say no. And I agree with them. But they were not aware that 20, 30 years after they die, the men would start wearing chain. So today, I would, if you ask me, I would say, <coughs> don't wear. Don't wear. But the trend is such that there may be a time later on. So I will not say it is haram. I would say don't wear. I being aware of the trend which many of the Islamic scholars may not be aware, I would say don't wear, but I wouldn't give the fatwa haram. I am not saying that the fatwa given by Sheikh bin Baz or Sheikh Utaymin or Nasr al is wrong. They are perfectly right. At that time even I would say haram. But now since I am aware of the changes, I would not say it is haram, but I would tell the Muslim don't wear. Maybe after 10 years, 20 years, 50 years when it is very common like how the wrist wash today, more men are wearing than the female. I cannot say it's haram. But today, I would ask the men that please don't wear neck chains. But if you ask me, is it haram? I would not say it is haram. I would be precautious. Because if I say haram, I am aware of the trend. And there are very high possibilities. In the next few decades, the percentage of men wearing will become more. Like the example I gave of wristwatch, when not, not a single man wore for more than 200 years and then they started wearing, now there is quite a large percentage of men wearing chains, whether it's 10% or 20% or more, they are wearing. But, and the same like the wristwatch of a female differs than the wristwatch of a male. Similarly, the chains of the male and female differ. So, if a Muslim asks me, should a Muslim wear a ch silver chain? I would say, please don't wear it. Avoid it. But would I give the fatwa haram? No. I would not say it is haram. Because I am aware of the trend. 
and I'm aware, but I would say, Muslims, please don't wear chains, even if it's not made of gold, whether it's silver. But best is to avoid. When you're in doubt, leave it out, whether you call it makru or not. I would refrain from saying haram, but I would advise the Muslims that please don't wear chain. What's the requirement? Others will let them wear. Why involved in something which is doubtful? Because the hadith is very clear cut that you should not wear clothes that which pertain to a female. A man should not wear clothes that which pertain to a female. And females should not wear clothes that which pertain to a man. And we know many a times that, for example, the trousers were only worn by men, not by female. But now the trend has started. So if you ask me that can a female wear a trousers on top of that she's wearing a abaya, she's fulfilling all the criteria of the hijab, she's wearing a abaya which is loose, but internally she's wearing a trousers, I would say yes, it's permitted. As long as the trousers are a female trousers, it's not a male trousers. So you have trousers which are a female, trousers are basically worn by male, but today if a female wears a uh, izar, which is meant for female, and outside she's wearing a abaya, outside she's wearing, in the house, within the uh, within the family members which are mehram, it's permitted. So, depending upon what the trend is, but technically, Islamically, something which is pertaining exclusively for female, a male cannot wear, something which is pertaining exclusively for a male, a female cannot wear. So, based on this, I would suggest that Muslims should avoid wearing a neck chain, even though it's not of good. Hope that answers the question. The question posed. Is, I think it's a question on on the Facebook. Asad says, most respect and love to Dr. Zakir from Pakistan. I am a Muslim by birth, but I have never really done dawah. Would I be considered a good Muslim? It's a very good question by Asad Said that he is a Muslim from Pakistan, but he has never done dawah. So would he be considered as a good Muslim? According to Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 4, sorry, verse number 1 to 3, it says, Wal Asr, inna al insan la fi khusr, that by the token of time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking the oath of time. That man is verily in a state of loss. Man is in khasara. Wal Asr, inna al insan la fi khusr. That except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. This surah, Surah Al-Asr, is called as Rahe Nijat, the path to salvation. And according to Imam Ash-Shafi, he said that if this surah alone was revealed for humanity, it would have been sufficient for the salvation. That means this surah alone would have been sufficient for salvation, for guidance and nothing else. So this surah says that man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have four criteria. Those who have faith, iman, those who amal as salihat, who have righteous deed, watawa sabil haq, inviting people to truth, that is doing dawah and islah. And Watawa Sobi Sabr, inviting people to patience and perseverance. So according to the surah, there are minimum four criteria for any human being to go to Jannah. Number one is Iman, having faith. Number two, Amal Salihat, doing righteous deed. Number four, inviting people to truth, that is doing Dawah and Islam. And fourth is inviting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these criteria under normal circumstances is missing, you shall not enter Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you and put in Jannah, that's Allah's prerogative. Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, 48, and Surah Nisa chapter 4, 116, that if Allah pleases, 
he may forgive any sin, but the sin of shirk he'll not forgive. So according to Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48 and Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 116, Allah may forgive any sin if he wishes, except the sin of shirk he'll not forgive. So under normal circumstances, if you are not doing dawa, it is a requirement to go to Jannah. If you don't do dawa, you are not fulfilling the requirement to go to Jannah. It's a fard. If Allah wants to forgive you different but normal circumstances, you may be a very good Muslim, you may be praying five times a day, you may be fasting in the month of Ramadan, you may be giving zakat, you may have gone for hajj. But if you do not do dawa, according to Surah Al-Asad, you shall not go to Jannah. So that means dawa is very important. You ask me the question, if I don't do dawa, can I be considered a good Muslim? You cannot be com considered as a complete Muslim or a good Muslim or a good practicing Muslim. For you to be a good practicing Muslim, you should do dawa at least part time. There's another verse in Surah Al Imran chapter 3 verse 104 which says let there arise out of you a band of people that enjoin people to the good and forbid them from doing wrong. This verse of the Quran is talking about full time da'is. How we are full time doctors, full time engineers, full time lawyers. How many full time da'is do you have? You can count them on your fingertip. How many people do you have full time da'is means who are on the stage or in their life the major time of the day is going and inviting people talking to the non-Muslims. How many do we have? You can count them on your fingertips. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fusila chapter 41 verse number 33, the ayah I started this program with, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَالَ مِمَّنْ دَوَيْلَ اللَّهِ وَأَمِلُ صَالِحُمْ وَقَالَ إِنَّنِ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness and says that I am a Muslim. This verse of the Quran says that the best profession of a Muslim the best profession for a Muslim is of a die. What are the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was a Muslim. He was a die. His main work was to convey the message of Islam to the others. So the best profession for a Muslim is a die. So being full-time da'i is the best profession, being part-time da'i is minimum that's required. So da'wah is fard for every Muslim. And I request all the Muslims and brothers and sisters that whatever possible, however many non-Muslim friends you have, whether Christian, whether Hindu, see to it that you convey the message of Islam. And however many Muslims you have, if you find that something is lacking, you do Islam with them. When we speak to Muslims, giving them more information about Islam, it's called as Islam. When we call the non-Muslims towards Islam, that's called as Dawah. So it's the best that the Muslims should do Dawah and Islam both, so that they can enter Jannah. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi My name is Muhammad Sazid. I am from Bihar, India. I am a hotel management student. I want to know that while offering prayer in tashahud, is only pointing forefinger is enough or should I have to move the forefinger up and down? 
The second question is where should I look in prayer during ruku and tashahud? The question asked by Muhammad Sazid is that in tashahud, when you are praying the is pointing the finger sufficient, the forefinger is talking about, or is moving it up and down a requirement? And where should I look while I am in the tashahud? Or when I am in the ruku, where should I look? As far as pointing the finger is concerned, pointing the forefinger, all the scholars say, is there. But as far as moving the finger is concerned, there are difference of opinion and there is different ishtihad. As far as the Hanafi school of thought is concerned, in the Tayyad, when we say Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, when you say La, they normally have to raise the finger that there is no God. And when they say Illa Allah except Allah, they bring it down. So in the Hanafi school of thought, Imam Abu Hanifa, his ishtihad was that in the Attayat, in the Tashahud, when you say Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, when you say La, there is no God, you raise the finger. And when you say except Allah, Illa Allah, you bring it down. So in, in Attayat, Ashadu, they bring it up and they bring it down. As far as Imam Shafi is concerned, the Shafi school of thought, they raise the finger when they say Illa Allah, except Allah, and they keep it raised till the end of the Shafi. As far as the Maliki school of thought is concerned, Imam Malik, they move the finger left to right. As far as Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, or the humbly school of thought is concerned, they raise the finger during the dua. And at Tayyat is the full dua. So as far as pointing the finger is concerned, there is unanimous agreement that the forefinger should be pointed. And there are various hadiths on that. As far as Sheikh Nasr al Alman is concerned, he says that regarding whatever these four schools of thought say, there is no evidence in any of the say hadith regarding when the finger should be raised and when it should be got down, whether there should be left or right. He says the closest is Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, that you raise it for dua. Regarding the other schools of thought, there is no evidence. And there are various hadith talking about raising the finger. There are various say hadith. And there are hadith in Sunan Nisai, in, Ahmed, in uh, uh, Musnad Ahmad, in Bukhari, in Muslim, about raising the forefinger. And all these hadiths say that the Prophet raised the forefinger or the finger closest to the thumb. There's a hadith in Musnad Ahmad, also in Sunan Nisai, which is authenticated by Nasrud al-Bani as a Sai hadith in Sunan Nisai, where it describes the Salah in detail. The Prophet stood and he kept his uh, right hand on the left hand and it covered the wrist and the hand and the forearm and detail went in ruku, went in sujood. When it come to tashahud, I am not completing the full hadith, this is a long hadith, that he placed his left hand over his left thigh and he placed his right hand over his right thigh and he made a ring from the middle finger and the thumb. His middle finger and the thumb, he turned it into a ring like this. It's a high hadith. And he pointed with his forefinger. Another hadith says he pointed with his index finger. Another hadith says he pointed with the finger closest to the thumb. There are various hadith which talks about pointing of the finger, so there is no doubt about it. This hadith also says he pointed the finger during dua. There are various hadith, and when I was studying hadith, one of my first Ustad or teacher in Hadith was Dr. Sheikh Zairaman Azmi, Mellagran in Jannah. He expired two years ago. He was the dean of the Hadith department in Medina. And I studied Hadith with him, of, but naturally it was private classes. He exclusively gave time to me and we studied for about a month. And he had said that there are various say Hadith in saying that the index finger should be raised during dua. And as Nasr al-Bani rightly said that all the hadith say that during dua the finger is raised. There are various say hadith. 
there is one say hadith which says that during every dua the finger should be raised so if you're doing a dua it should be raised and the one hadith which says that the forefinger to the shaitan is like an iron rod so there's one hadith which does describe about keeping on raising the finger up and down so amongst if you if you analyze all the say hadith the opinion of imam ibn hanbal is the best that during the full attayat the forefinger should be raised that's the right opinion and there are also hadith saying that the the finger can be moved up and down but according to the aramanad mean there are various hadith saying it should be raised during dua so there are two opinions in the humbly school of thought the only raising it for the full dua is one opinion and another opinion is that, that you can move it up and down both are correct but there are more hadith talking about that the finger should be raised throughout attayat so but if you follow any of the four schools of thought because they are a great i mass these are small issues but if you want to be closer to quran and sunna then raise your finger during the full tashahhud and there are hadith also saying that you can move it up and down but only only raising it for the full attayat there are various hadith and one hadith does talk about shaking also both acceptable regarding a second question that where should a person look in the ruku and where should his eyes focus in the tashahhud the scholar the unanimous that the best place according to Sheikh Uthaymin bin Baaz and Nasr al-Albani the best place that a person should look during salah while he's standing or in ruku is at the place of his prostration so where he prostrates he should look so if he's standing in the qiyam he should look at the place of prostration when he's doing his ruku he should look at the place of prostration when sujood he should look at the place of prostration but while he is in tashahhud or in between the two sujood there is a hadith which which is a sahih hadith we says that the prophet looked at the forefinger the index finger which was raised so the scholars say that while sitting in the tashahhud or in between the two sujood at that time it is encouraged to look at your forefinger but while standing and in ruku it's encouraged to look at the place of sujood but in tashahhud and in between the two a two sujood you should look at the forefinger or some scholars say even looking at your right hand it's permitted hope that answers the question the next question my name is santosh and i am from bangalore india i own a retail business in bangalore related to health and wellness products i have been following you for a very long time and i admire your work i am a revert muslim now alhamdulillah my question is i have been feeling on and off about my faith towards allah i get confused and deviate myself from deen because of the worldly pleasures how do i hold my faith strong and firm so that i do not get deviated and i also want to be a dai like you please guide and suggest thank you brother santosh from bangalore he has been watching my videos and following me since a long time and alhamdulillah now he is a muslim revert he has accepted islam but he says that very often he gets deviated and it's difficult for him to be firm on the deen because of the worldly pleasure he keeps on getting deviated so he wants some help how should he be firm on the deen and avoid the worldly pleasures which are not permitted in islam and he also wants to become a dai and he asked me a suggestion regarding a muslim as you know the the times now the whole world has become a global village 
and as science and technology is improving, is advancing, the fitna is also increasing. Doing dawah has become easy because of technology, but there's more fitna. So the technology that is increasing, whether it be social media, whether Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, the social media, the, there are good things. You can get information at the click of a button, everything on your fingertips. You ask check Google, you get the reply. You want anything about Islam, it's very easy. Unlike the previous time, you Google, you get the reply. So there are pros and cons both. But the cons are more than the pros. The fitna on the social media is much more than the good things. So what we as Muslims should do, see to it that we utilize it for good things. Whether it be social media, whether it be that's happening technology. Technology per se is not haram. Using it for haram things is haram. So I do agree with you brother that there is a lot of fitna for many things, for pleasure, etc. So what we should do, number one is that the Prophet said, be in good company. And there's a hadith in the Prophet said, that if you meet a, a coal, coal man, a person who's a blacksmith, there are high chances that his black coal will rub on you or on your clothes. But when you meet a perfume sim, if you meet a perfume seller, the high chances that the good fragrance of his perfume will come onto you. Indicating that when you stay in company, be in company of good practicing Muslims and avoid the company of those who are away from the team. So number one formula is see to it that the people that are around you, your friends, are good pious Muslims. And stay away from those friends who are away from the deen. So if you have a friend who's praying five times salah, who's offering tajud, who's fasting in the month of Ramadan, who's doing more of the nawafil fast, who's giving charity, who's always talking about Quran, Hadith, it's better to be with him than a Muslim friend or a non-Muslim friend who may be drinking alcohol, who may be smoking, who may be having girlfriends, who may be doing zina. So number one is, see to it you have a friend circle which is on the deen. And if you have less, go out and find the people who are more Islamic. And see to it that when there are attractions, you see to it that you get more pleasure by the Islamic activities. We know that the fitna is there, the music is there, you get impressed with music and you enjoy, you change it into enjoying the Khirat. Now everything on a click of a button. When you can get music easily on the YouTube, on the Facebook, you can get Kiraz very easily. So see to it that you change your desire to things which will benefit you in Akhirah. Allah says that if you strive for dunya, Allah will give you dunya but will not give you Akhirah. If you strive for Akhirah, Allah will give you Akhirah and dunya both. That's the reason when we do dua. The best dua is of Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 201 where Allah says Rabbana atina fid dunya hasnatam wa fil akhirat hasnatakina azab bin nar Oh my Lord give me the best in this world and the hereafter and save me from the torment of the hellfire The one verse before this is we know this dua but very few people know the verse before that The verse before that says that if you ask for dunya Allah will give you dunya but will not give you akhirah The better of the Muslims are those who pray that oh my Lord give me the best in this world and the akhirah and save me from the torment of hellfire. In this dua there are three things asked. Give me the best in this world. Number two give me the best in the hereafter. And number three save me from the torment of hellfire. So actually you are asking for three things. From three things one third is for this dunya and two third is for akhirah. So when you are doing dua see to it you do more dua for the akhirah than the dunya. So, one scholar said that even in this we get guidance from Allah that two-third you do dua for the akhirah, one-third for dunya. That doesn't mean you do dua only for dunya, dunya. If you do only for dunya, Allah will give you dunya but not akhirah. If you do for akhirah, Allah will give akhirah and dunya both. So, my advice to you, brother Santosh, is see to it that your friends are kids who are good practicing Muslims, who pray five times a day, who offer tahajjud, who 
fast, who give zakat, who talk good things, and see to it that you listen to lectures of the duats who impress you, who may give lectures which are logical, who may convince you. And the more you listen to them, see to it that you follow it. See to it that you offer five times salah in congregation in the mosque. It's a fard. Many people offer salah but may not offer in congregation. Some may offer congregation at home but may not offer at the mosque. According to Imam Adhabi, offering salah in congregation in a mosque is fard. And if you don't do it, it's a major sin. He labels it as 56 major sin if you do not offer salah in congregation in a mosque without a valid reason. So my request to you see to it that you offer salah five times a day in congregation in the mosque. And imagine your life would be different. See to it besides offering the five times for the salah, you also offer the tahajjud in the last one third of the night. And the Prophet said the best prayer after the five times first prayer is the night prayer. It's a it's hadith in Sahih Muslim, volume number three, hadith number 2755, that the best prayer after the further five times prayer is the Qayyamul Layl. Talking about the Vitar, and if with the Vitar you join with the Tajud, especially in the last one third of the night, and the Prophet prayed eight rakat Tajud and three rakat Vitar, he prayed 11 rakat. In the last one third of night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the lower heaven. And there is an A which he says, does any of my servant want anything? And I will answer the prayer. So when you pray during this last one third night and see to it that your sujood, your sajda is long. And if you pray during sajda, during the last one third of night, in tajjud to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, your prayers will be answered. And there if you say that please keep me away from the fitna of the world, the worldly desire, and inshallah, Allah will help you. So the scholar rightly said that you cannot say that you have tried everything or you have not left a single stone unturned unless you ask for Allah in your tahajjud salah, in fujud, in the last one third of the night. So my request to you would besides praying five times salah, see to you pray the tahajjud salah, you can start with 20 minutes, increase it to half an hour, maybe one hour, can be two hours better. And see to it the sujoods are long, maybe one minute, one and a half minute, two minutes each sujood. So that if you do sujood for eight rakat, there are uh, there are sixteen sujoods you do in the eight rakat, and maybe half an hour you spend only in sujood. And you ask what you feel is the best. Then even offering the salat al duha. And the Prophet said, you know, the Hadith Abu Huraira. May Allah be uh, pleased with him. That my close friend referring to the Prophet told me that do not miss three things. That is praying, that is fasting three days in a month, referring to the Ayyamul Beat, 13th, 14th, and 15th. And praying the uh, night prayer and seeing to it that talking about the Vitar prayer and the and the Tajit prayer. And and he also said that about Salatu Duha, that praying the Salatu Duha. So these three things the Prophet recommended and it's very important. So the more you do your ibadah and besides your farais, doing the nawafil and hearing lectures of the duas, this will keep you on the straight track and then your enjoyment will change from the haram to the halal, not only halal to mustab and to fard. So, seeing to you have good company, you listen to the scholars and the more ibadah you do, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will see to it that you get peace in your life, the serenity. With all the things that we have hustle bustle in the world, imagine the serenity in offering salah is excellent and doing dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeing to it that there are some dua, some times of dua which are more accepted, like the one hour on Friday after Asar, before Maghrib. It's one hour that the hour of prayers. 
Now, if you ask Allah, we'll answer your prayers. So if you do more of the sunnahs, more of the mustahab, then inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will see to the life is filled with, with pleasure, with iman, and with satisfaction. And number one is see to it that you abstain from the 70 major sins. As the Quran rightly says, that if you abstain from the major sins, Allah will forgive your minor sin. So if you follow, if you read the book of Imam Madhabi, the Qabair, and you follow the 70 things, it will tell you the major faraiz that are there, offering fight and but natural. Abstain from shirk is the major sin. Number one, then he goes to murder, then black magic, then offering fight and salah, then giving zakat, fasting in the month of Ramadan, hajj if you have to do, and it goes in order. So this covers the major faraiz and also the major sins. And then, inshallah, you can go and see to it that you try and abstain the moderate sins or the minor sins. And inshallah, the moment you start and you keep on following more and more, Allah helps you and your life will change. And inshallah, you will find the serenity and the pleasure and you find a qalbi salim, that's a, a peaceful heart. Inshallah. Question posed from YouTube, Bilal Ahmed, what is the best good deed in Islam? There's a difference between what is the best belief and what's the best deed. Of course, the best belief and the most important, it is Tawheed. And the biggest sin is Shirk. So number one is Tawheed. But in terms of deed, the Hadith of the Prophet, that the first deed that Allah will ask you on the day of judgment, it is a salah. And there's a hadith in Sayyid Muslim that the Prophet said that salah differentiates a person from Iman and Kuf. The thing that differentiates a person from a Mu'min and a Kafir is the salah. So the most important deed that Allah will ask you on the day of judgment in terms of thing, it is salah. And the most important salah are the five times salah. So the best deed a Muslim should be particular in doing it is offering five times salah. It's a fard in Islam. And the Quran has stipulated it and the various hadith, the five times salah, the fajr salah, the zohar, the asar, the maghrib, and the isha and the timings are given. And the Quran says, be careful of your middle salah. Middle Salah referring to, there are two opinions, that if you look at the Islamic day, the Islamic day starts from Maghrib, so the Middle Salah will become the Fajr Salah. If you are talking about normal day starting from Fajr, so Middle Salah becomes the Asr Salah. But naturally you should offer all the five times Salah. And as I mentioned in my earlier answer, that offering Salah five times a day in congregation in a mosque. Most of the scholars say it is, it is Fard, or it is for the kifaya. But according to Imam al-Dhabi, he says in his book, The Qabair, that if you do not offer salah in congregation in a mosque without a valid reason, it is a major sin. And he lists it as 56th major sin. And I am more leaning towards his view that it is further for a Muslim man to offer salah in congregation in a mosque. So the best deed for a Muslim would be to offer the five times salah. And for the men, five times salah in congregation in the mosque. This is the best deed. Hope that answers the question. There's a question from the Facebook. Rojani Islam. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam. Please tell me about freelancing job. Is it haram or halal? 
the question posed is, is freelancing job haram or halal? Freelancing means, freelance means you are doing a job on your own. You are not a permanent job. There's something, a permanent job, you go to an office from 9 to 5 or from 10 to 6 and every day you go, it's a fixed job, long-term job. Freelancing job means a job which is someone may hire you for a limited time. May hire you for maybe one month, may hire you for two weeks, may be hired for a few hours or few days. So freelancing job means you hire a person not on a permanent method, not on a permanent basis, but on a temporary basis. It may be for a few months, it may be for a few weeks, it may be for a few days, it may be for a few hours. So that is called as a freelancing job. He's not a full-time employee of yours. He's doing on a free freelancing basis or it may be a few days in a month, maybe one day in a month, one day in a week. It is called a freelancing. So freelancing per se is not haram, but the job you are doing should be halal, should be as per the rules of the Islamic Sharia. If you are doing a freelancing halal job, then that freelancing halal job becomes halal. But if you are doing a freelancing haram job, then it becomes haram. For example, if you are doing freelancing of selling alcohol, it's haram. You are doing freelancing of selling pork, okay, when you are on pork you can call me, whenever you call me, once in a while, once in a week, I'll supply you pork, it's haram. When you call, I'll supply you alcohol, it's haram. But you may say, okay, fine, freelancing job, if you want to do your bookkeeping, your accounts, I'll come and do it, freelancing business, once a week, twice a week, no problem, as long as the accounts, the business is halal. Or if you're sick, you may call a doctor, doctor comes and, and give the treatment, it's halal. So if the job is halal, is not breaking any rules of the Islamic Sharia, <coughs> and it's a permitted job, then that freelancing job is halal. If it's a haram job, it's haram. The freelancing per se is not haram. As long as the job that you're doing should be halal, should not be haram job, should not involve any haram activity, should not involve interest, riba, should not involve haram things like alcohol or pork, etc. If it doesn't involve the haram elements, freelancing per se is allowed in Islam. Hope that answers the question. The next question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. I am Firoz Sheikh from New York, USA. I am a student. After the Fard fast of Ramadan, which amongst the voluntary fast are the most important in order of priority? There are various voluntary fast besides fasting in the month of Ramadan. And we know very well the Quranic verses and the various hadith. We say that fasting the complete month of Ramadan, whether 29 days or 30 days, is Fard for every Allah Muslim. Hussain, and who has, who is healthy, it's for every adult Muslim man or woman. If he's sane, if he's conscious, if he has the health, and if he's not traveling, fasting the full month of Ramadan, where the 29 or 30 days is farth. All the fast besides the fast of Ramadan are voluntary. The question posed by Firoz Sheikh is, which is the most important fast in order of priority? As far as the most important fast is concerned, there's a hadith in Sahih Muslim, volume number three, hadith number 2747, in which the Prophet said that if you fast on Yom al Arafah, that is the ninth day of the Lijjah, Allah will forgive the sins of your previous years and the next years. So based on this hadith, the scholar says, this is the most important fast 
after the fast of Ramadan. So majority of the scholars say the most important fast after the fast of Ramadan is fasting on Yom al-Arafah, that is 9th of Dhulijjah, based on the Hadith of the Prophet of Sahih Muslim, volume number 3, Hadith number 2747, that if you fast on the day of Arafah, on 9th Dhulijjah, Allah will forgive your sin of the previous years and the following year. There's one more Hadith <coughs> which is there in Sahih Muslim, volume number 3, Hadith number 2755, which says the most important fast after the fast of the month of Ramadan is fasting on Ashura, the 10th of Muharram. And the Hadith continues, the most important Salah after the five time Salah is, is praying Salah at night, that is the Qayyam al -Layl. Because of this Hadith, some scholars say that the most important is the fasting on Ashura. But most of the scholars disagree because the other Hadith of Sai Muslim, volume number 3, Hadith number 2746 says that anyone who fasts on Yom Al-Arfa, that is the 10th of Muharram, Allah will forgive his sins of the previous year. So since the Sai Hadith of Sai Muslim, volume number 3, Hadith number 2746 says that if you fast on, on Muharram the Ashura, the 10th of Muharram Ashura, your previous year's sins are washed away, one year. But the next hadith of Sahih Muslim, volume number 3, hadith number 2747, says that if you fast on Yom al Arafah, the 9th Dulajja, two years' sin will be forgiven, the previous years and the following year. But naturally, it's understood that the sins that the hadith are talking about are the minor sins. It doesn't talk about the major sins. That the minor sins you do, if you fast on, on, on Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, your previous year sins will be washed away. If you fast on Yom al-Arafah, two years in previous and next year. So most of the scholars agree that fasting on Yom al-Arafah is the most important. Some scholars say that fasting on Ashura is the most important. But all of nuances agree that the two most important fasts are fasting on Yom al-Arafah and Yom al uh, Yom al um, Ashura. The 9th of Dhul and the 10th of Muharram. So the most important is Yom al-Arafah, the next is Yom al-Ashara, the 10th of Muharram. The third most important fast are the fast of the first nine days of dhul -Ajjah. The hadith of the Prophet that says in Sahih Bukhari, that is volume number two, hadith number 969, the Prophet said that the deeds done on the first ten days of dhul -Ajjah are the most important deeds done in the full year. The deeds, the good deeds done on the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah are the most important deeds done as compared to any other days of the year. So when the Sahaba asked, what about Jihad? He said, even Jihad, the good deeds done in the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah is more important even than Jihad done on any other day of the year unless the person goes for Jihad and comes back without his wealth and without his life. That means unless he is martyred and all his wealth is gone away, that is the only one deed which is better than the deeds done on the ten days of the Rija. And the Hadith of Abu Daud, that is volume number three, Hadith number uh, two, four, two, four, three, seven, that the Prophet fasted on the first nine days of the Rija. So after fasting on Arafah and on Ashura, the most important would be fasting the first eight days of the Rija. Ninth we already covered, first day of the Rija. And then would be fasting on the ninth and the eleventh of Muharram. So the first two fasts are ninth of the Rija and the tenth of Muharram. Next is the first eight days of the Rija, first eight days of the Rija, and then the ninth and the 11th of Muharram. The Prophet said, the Yahud fasted only on 10th of Muharram. I will fast if I live the next year for two days, 9th and 10th or 10th or 11th. And the best is fasting all three days, 9th, 10th and 11th of Muharram. So the next best fasting in order of priority would be the eight days of, first eight days of Dhulijjah and the uh, 
9th and 11th of Muharram. The next in priority, in priority would be the Ayyamul Bidah. Because the Prophet had told, even the hadith of, of Abu Huraira, may Allah be with him, that my best friend told me not to leave three things every day. That is praying the Tajjud Salah, praying Salatul Duha, and fasting on three days of the year on Ayyamul Bidah. Fasting on the 13th, 14th and 15th of every month, Ayyamul Bid, it is the next best in fasting. Then would be the six days of Shawwal. So the Prophet said that anyone who after the fast of Ramadan, fasting the full month of Ramadan, if he follows with the six days in the month of Shawwal, it's as though he has fasted the full year. Then would be fasting on Mondays and Thursdays. The Prophet said that I was born on Monday and, and the Prophet also said that the deeds go up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Monday and Thursday. And when the deeds go, I would prefer it going when I am fasting. So fasting on Monday and Thursday is also very important. And the other fast, which is the important voluntary fast, is the fasting of Dawud al -Salam. He used to fast alternately. And the hadith says there that the best fasting, amongst all the fasting, voluntary fast, is of Dawud al -Salam fasting alternately. Now, you have to understand that when I'm telling the order, it is based on one single fast, which is the best, is Yom al-Arafah. The next best fast, is Ashura, 10th of Muharram. But if someone asks me, if I have to follow one type of fast, which is the best? Of course, fasting every alternate day is the best because when you are fasting alternate days, besides Ramadan, there are 11 months. So if you remove 30 days out of 365 days, or remove uh, 29 days out of 365 days, you get a total of 336 days. So fasting alternate days of three or alternate days of 330, uh, 366 days, or sorry, 336 days, would be, would be 168 days. So fasting 168 days is very important. But one fast most important is Arafah. Second is Yomul Arsha. Yomul Ashura. Someone asked me, which is more important? Fasting Monday, Thursday is more important, or fasting the Yamul Bid? Now if you are fasting Monday and Thursday, in a month, there are about four weeks. So, you are fasting eight days in a month. Because twice a week, Monday and Thursday. Vis a vis, three days ayam will be. So, fasting eight days on Monday and Thursday would be preferable than fasting three days of ayam will be. But if someone asks me, if I am to fast only three days in a month, which is the most important? Fasting only three days. Is of course ayam will be on 13th, 14th and 15th. Anyway, fasting on those days is not a compulsory. If you miss, the Prophet even said you can fast one day in the beginning of the month, one day in the middle of the month, one day in the end of the month and your ayam will be this done. Or if you fast on Monday and Thursday, two Mondays and one Thursday, then also yeah, it's done on three days. But the best is ayam will be on 13th, 14th and 15th of every lunar month when the moon is full moon, called as the white days. But eight days, Monday and Thursday, better than three days of Ayam will be. So you cannot give an order that way. But if you are counting one fast, the order which I said is correct. Only one fast, then Arafah, then, then would be Yamal Ashara. The next few fast, the first eight days of, of Dhulijah, then of the 9th and 11th of Muharram, then would be three days of Ayam will be, then would be Shawwal, then would be Monday, Thursday. And then would be alternate day because there are more number of fast to, to do only one fast of Arafah is easy. Then, so if you want to fast one day in a year besides Ramadan, then do Arafah. If you want to do two, do Arafah and Ashura, 9th of uh, Dhulujah and 10th of, then you do more. So, but naturally if you are doing Monday, Thursday, full year, 
The content is much more. In 11 months, that is uh, 48 weeks into two, you are fasting 96 days in a year. If you are doing Monday and Thursday, 96 days in a year. If you are doing alternate fast of Dawud al Salam, you are fasting for 168 days in a year. So of course, that would be the best. Then would be 98. But if one fast, then the order I give. So everything is subjective. But I hope I've given you uh, a brief outline of the importance of each fast. Hope that's the question. The next question. I intend to fast for the rest of my life on Mondays and Thursdays. There are problems in my life and I am a sinner. Thus, I want to fast on these two days of the week so my heart will be in peace. Is it okay? And even if I am on a trip, should I take these two days fast? And if I were destined to get married and then my husband doesn't permit me to fast these two days, am I guilty? The question posed by, by, by the lady, it's a sister in Islam, who says that, you know, she is a sinner, she has committed many things which are wrong. So she intends to fast two days every week on Monday and Thursday. Is it okay? Is it good? Very good. And I discussed in my earlier answer, fasting on Monday and Thursday. Very good. And if you intend and fast, it's not a fard, it's a voluntary fast. So if you fast on Monday and Thursday, you'll be fasting twice a week, leaving aside the fard fast of Ramadan. You will be fasting 48 weeks. So every Monday and Thursday fast throughout the year. It would be 96 days in a year. Very good, Alhamdulillah. Very good. The next question is that if I am traveling, can I fast? Yes, you can fast. Fasting while you are traveling is not fard. Even the Ramadan fast which are fard fast, if you find that traveling makes you difficult to fast, even the Ramadan fast which are fard can be delayed. But nowadays, most of the travels are easy. You travel in a plane, you travel in air condition, you travel in a bus. Unlike earlier times that you're traveling on the camel, in the sun, in the heat, it's difficult. So nowadays, fasting is easy. Someone asked me if Allah has given me permission while traveling not to fast. And, if I'm, and most of the Ramadan I keep on traveling. It would be a big headache for me to travel otherwise, to fast otherwise. So if I say I will not fast because I'm traveling, I'll fast afterwards, it's permitted. But imagine when I'm fasting, when no one else is fasting and other things that they, I would not like it at all. Traveling is hardly any difficult. I personally would not want to delay my fasting. And most of the Ramadan I travel, you know, whether they're giving talks on the Dawa activity, the month of Ramadan. I fast always. Allah has given the Duksa. But if you can do it, very good. And it hardly makes a difference. So, but naturally, similarly, if you have committed to fast on Monday and Thursday, while you you can fast. If you find it difficult, no, you don't fast, no problem. Regarding your last question, that if I get married and if my husband doesn't give me permission, am I guilty? The rule is for the fard fast in Ramadan, permission of the husband need not be taken. But for all voluntary fast, if a woman is married, it is compulsory that she should take the permission of the husband before doing voluntary fast because in fasting the sexual relationship is prohibited. During fasting you can't have sexual relationship. So if you are fasting and if the husband wants to have a relationship with you during that day of fasting, you will not be allowed to do it. That is the reason for a woman if she is married, it is compulsory for the voluntary fast she should take permission of the husband. And the husband, if he's a good Muslim, if she asked, especially for those sunnah fast like Arafah or fasting on, on Yom al or the first nine days of the Lijjah or the eight, nine, ten of, of, of the Muharram or Ayyamul Beed, the husband should give permission. Why should he not say no? Yes, if someone says I want to fast alternate days and if the husband cannot do and he has a desire, so he may not permit you. But taking permission of the husband for voluntary fast is a must. If you do a niya, that will fast every Monday and Thursday and then if the husband doesn't give you permission, you are not guilty. Your niya was there, husband didn't give you permission, you can convince him if he, if he agrees, 
you can do. But as I told in the early answer, be sure that you do not miss the other fast. Fasting on, on Arafah is the most important, then on the Ashura, 9th of Zilajja and the 10th of Muharram, very important. The first nine days of Tulajja, very important. 9, 10, 11 of Muharram, important. Ayyamul Beed. See to it that you also do on these and on better. Not that you do only on, night, on Monday, Thursday and don't do any of the other Sunnah fast. Hope that answers the question. And the next question. Hello. Respected Dr. Sakhir Naik. My name is Sujoy Kumar Das. I am a student. I am from Plassey, West Bengal, India. You said in your lecture, many scientific facts we know today have already been mentioned in the Quran. For example, the shape of the earth, moonlight is reflected light, etc. So why did people in the 6th century think that the earth was flat and that moonlight was its own light? Thank you. But the Sujay Kumar Das seems to be a non-Muslim. I asked that he heard my lecture and I said that, you know, there are many scientific facts mentioned in the Quran, which were discovered recently. The Quran was revealed 400 years ago. These scientific facts were discovered yesterday, maybe 500 years back, 300 years back, 200 years back, etc. So, in the 6th century, why did, when the Quran mentioned about that the earth is spherical, and the light of the moon is reflected light. So why in the 6th century people believed that the earth was flat and the light of the moon was shown? First let me tell you one thing, that the Quran was not revealed in the 6th century. Prophet Muhammad was, was born on 570 AD and the first revelation came when he was 40 years old. That was the 610 AD. So the Quran was revealed in the 7th century. Point number one. Point number two, it doesn't have to be when the Quran was revealed, everyone knows about it. What you have to understand, that Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, but it's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. -S. There are more than 6,000 ayats, more than 6,000 signs in the glorious Quran, out of which more than a thousand speak about science. So Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C, -E it's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. Now first you have to understand that each verse of the Quran, mashallah, has got various information. Many words of the Quran have multiple meanings. So the Quran was revealed as a book of guidance, as a book of hidayah, as a book of guidance to take people away from the hellfire and toward Jannah. When you read the Quran, there are two types of reading. One is tazakkur -e quran one is tadabbur -e quran tazakkur -e quran means reading the Quran, superficially or just reading it and understanding it. One is tadabbur -e quran that is pondering over the Quran, thinking of its meaning, in-depth thinking. tazakkur -e quran you just read, you understand the meaning without much pondering, but you get the message. So the Buri Quran is with pondering and trying to know more of it. When the Quran was revealed, the basic message what was there coming from the first prophet Adam al -Salam, to the last prophet, prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, is the same about Tawheed. So the basic message of the Quran is talking about Tawheed, oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, following his commandments. But naturally when the Quran was revealed, the message was, was very clear. Unlike the other revelations, Allah says in this Quran that I have perfected my religion for you and chosen you for deen. So it talked about the aqam, about the do's and don'ts. Like praying five times is a farad in Islam. Then giving zakat is farad in Islam. Performing hajj is farad in Islam. Fasting in the month of Ram is farad. Don't have alcohol, don't have pork. Don't be involved in riba. So when you read the Quran, you understand the message of Tawhid very clearly. You understand about 
about the five pillars that praying five times is a fard, giving zakat is a fard, fasting the month of Ramadan is fard, performing hajj is fard. It talks about abstaining from major sin, don't do murder, then don't have alcohol, don't gamble, don't involve in riba. So the major do's and don'ts. But as you keep on reading the Quran, you get the basic message of Tawheed and the do's and don'ts, how a person should lead the life. But when you keep on reading more, you start pondering and getting more in-depth information. Besides basic message of Tawheed, now you come to more aspects of Tawheed. Though when you see the signs of Allah, you start having more faith in Allah. Then you start understanding when the Quran was revealed, it was not the age of science and technology. It was the age of literature and poetry. So at that time, people were more concentrating on the language of the Quran. When the Quran was revealed, Arabic was at its peak. The Arabs were proud of their Arabic language. So when people read the Quran, they were shocked. This Quran cannot be from a human being. The eloquence of the language. And that time they were on the peak. So many people accepted Islam only by hearing the Quran. That this cannot be a human handiwork. And they accepted the deen. At the time when the Quran was revealed was not the age and sunset technology. So the way the Quran mentions, like mentioned, that the Quran says the earth is flat. That time people weren't that much bothered. For example, Quran says in in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 78, verse number 6. In Surah Naziyat, chapter number uh, 78, verse number 30. Wal ard the And thereafter, we have made the earth accept. Okay. People, daha has a meaning which is spread out. Correct. The other meaning of daha it derived from the Arabic word duya meaning an egg. It refers to an ostrich egg. And we know the shape of the earth is not completely round like a ball. It is flattened from the pole, the same like a shape of an ostrich egg. So at that time people did not ponder so much like what we are doing now. And now when science and technology is advanced, you are referring to the light of the moon is not its own light. It's the verse, the various verses in the Quran. So when the Quran d describes the moonlight, as compared to sunlight, the sunlight is referred to as siraj, meaning torch, diya, meaning a blazing lamp. The moonlight is referred to as munir or nur, borrowed light or reflection of light. At that time, both were light. So Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 61, that blessed is he, blessed is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has placed the constellation in the sky and placed therein sun, having light of its own, that is lamp, and moon, kamar, having borrowed light, munir. At that time, we both were light, so people didn't concentrate that what is the difference in this light and that light, they believe. Now when science has advanced and we have come to know, when we ponder, Quran has already mentioned this earlier, but now when we are pondering, we are coming to know. Like Quran says, that do they not ponder over the Quran? That when you ponder over the Quran, you come to know many of the signs. And you start believing more in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You start believing Tawhid more. So now when science and technology is advanced and we come to know that this information is already given in the Quran, why didn't we really ponder over it? So many things now after pondering we have come to know that science has discovered 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back. The Quran had already mentioned 400 years ago. So we Muslims at that time did not ponder so much. But now when science had advanced, then we come to know, okay, this is the same Quran. But now there are many verses which Quran mentions and science doesn't agree. Like Quran says there is life besides this earth. Science doesn't spoken about that. There are many Quran talks about Jannah and Jannam. Science hasn't read that far. So yet, there are many things which the Quran has mentioned which science hasn't advanced so much to prove it. What we say, that inshallah, we'll come to know about it soon. There is not a single verse in the Quran which is going against established science. So now, out of 100 points regarding science, 80 percent have already, hypothetically, 80 percent has already proved to be 100 percent correct. The remaining 20 percent is ambiguous, unknown. 
So my logic says when 80% is 100% perfect and the remaining 20% not even 0.01% is wrong. So my logic says inshallah even this 20% will be correct. So mine is a logical belief. You may say blind belief but actually it's a logical belief that among the scientific points mentioned in the Quran 80% has been proved to be 100% correct. The remaining 20% is ambiguous, neither right, neither wrong. That there are jinns, there is life after death, there is heaven and hell. All these things, inshallah, maybe 50 years back, later, 100 years later, science will prove it. So my logic says, inshallah, this ambiguous portion, which is about 20%, even that, inshallah, science will prove to be correct very soon. So it's a logical belief. So, in the 6th century, first of all, Quran wasn't revealed. Point number two, science was in advance. They came to you know, 100 years later, 200 years later, 400 years later about, about the earth that it was in 1500, in the 16th century, that the first person traveled around the earth and proved that the earth was spherical. So 16th century, it was established fact that the earth is spherical in shape. And we found that in the Quran also, the Muslims may not have paid that much attention. But what we realize that from the 8th to the 12th century, the Europeans, they called it the Dark Ages. But actually the amount of advancement made from the 8th to the 12th century by the Muslim scientists is phenomenal. The Europeans called it the Dark Age because they were not educated. But you see the father of chemistry, it is a Muslim. Uh, Jabir ibn Nahyan, when he discovered alcohol, he called it Al-Gul, meaning evil spirit. Most of the father of mathematics, they are Muslims, geography Muslims, medicine Muslims, Ibn Sina, Avicenna, and I've given the talk on that. So from the 8th to the 12th century, the Muslims were advanced fire because of Quran and Sunnah. When they read the Quran, they found many things and they implemented and they discovered it. So, they may not have discovered everything what the Quran says, but the Muslims were advanced in science and technology and the Arabs were very much advanced. Why? Because of the Quran. Now we have gone away from a deen, therefore you hardly find Muslim scientists. But in the past, most of the scientists were Muslim. Even if a non-Muslim wanted to know something about science in the 8th, 9th or 10th century, he had to learn Arabic. Arabic was major language of knowledge at that time. So, that's the reason it wasn't known on the 6th century, but now it's an established fact. It's also there in the Quran. Hope this answers the question. Inshallah, this will be the last question before we end the session. Uh, Shakir Pathan from Lahore, Pakistan. Why does Islam allow polygamy, a man to have more than one wife? A similar question is asked by another brother. I am Qasim from Nigeria, Borno State. I want to ask you a question pertaining to the logic of marrying more than one wife. You answered so many times during your lecture and we have Christian friends that used to challenge us on this issue. Can you please with due respect help me with the quotation of polygamy in Christianity, especially that of Prophet Abraham and Prophet Solomon, peace be upon them. The question posed by Brother Shakir is a very common question that why does Islam allow polygamy, a man to have more than one wife? And the question posed by Qasim that he has heard my answer, but can I give reference, especially on Christianity, saying that Prophet Abraham and Solomon had many wives, can I give the quotation? As far as polygamy is concerned, polygamy means a person having more than one spouse. There are two types of polygamy. If a man has more than one wife, it's called 
as polygyny. And if a woman has more than one husband, it's called as polyandry. So polyandry, a woman having more than one husband, is prohibited in Islam. As far as polygyny is concerned, a man having more than one wife, limited polygyny is permitted in Islam. As far as Islam is concerned, Quran is the only religious book on the face of the earth which says marry only one wife. There is no other religious scripture on the face of the earth, whether it be the Hindu scripture, the Jewish scripture or, or the Christian scripture, whether it be the Mahabharat or the Ramayana or the Vedas or Bhagavad Gita or the Talmud or the Bible where it says marry only one wife. In fact, if you read the Hindu scriptures, if you read Ramayana, the father of Sri Ram, King Dashrath, he had more than one wife. If you read Mahabharat, Sri Krishna, who is the god of the Hindus, it is mentioned he had 16,108 wives. So if Krishna, Lord Krishna of the Hindus, can have 16,108 wives, so why can't Muslim have maximum four. Similarly, in the Christian faith, in the Christian church, you are in Christianity, you are allowed to marry as many wives as you want. It's recently that the Christian church has prohibited and said the Christian can only marry one wife. In, in the Jewish community, it was permitted. If you read the scriptures, if you read the Bible or the Talmud, Abraham had three wives regarding the references. If you read Genesis chapter number 11, verse number 29, it says that Sarah was the wife of Abraham, peace be upon him. It is mentioned in the book of Genesis chapter number 16, verse number 3, that Sarah, the wife of Abraham, hired an Egyptian made by the name of Hajar or Hagar and later on she gave her in marriage as a wife to Abraham peace be upon him. Further it's mentioned in the book of Genesis chapter number 25 verse number 1 that Keturah was the wife of Abraham. So based on these three verse, different verses of the Bible we come to know that Abraham peace be upon him was a prophet of God according to the Bible had three wives. If you read the first Kings, first epistle of King, chapter number 11, verse number 3, it says that Solomon had 700 wives. So according to the Bible, the prophets of God had more than one wife. Some had three, some had more. Solomon had 700 wives. So according to Christianity and Judaism, they were permitted to marry as many wives as they want. There was no upper limit. As I mentioned, later on the church said that Christians should have only one wife. And as far as the Jews are concerned, the Jews married more than one wife. It was only when Rabbi Gershem ben Yehuda, who lived from 960 to 1030, he passed an edict that Jews should marry only one wife. And in the Sephardic communities, the Jewish Sephardic communities who lived amongst the Muslims, they married more than one wife till as late as 1950, until the chief rabbi of Israel put a ban on it. That means according to Christianity and Judaism, you can marry as many as you want. Recently, there was a ban put that you should only marry one. Similarly, if you read in the statistics published in India on the status of women in Islam, page number 65, 66 and 67, it says that the Hindus in India from 1951 to 1961, 5.06% involved in polygamous marriages and Muslims only 4.31% were involved in polygamous marriages. That means in India, the Hindus had 0.75% more polygamous marriages 
as compared to Muslims. Hindus were 5.06 percent, Muslims were 4.31 percent. That means 0.75 percent. The Hindus did more polygamous marriages as compared to Muslims in India. And you know, in India, it was earlier permitted. It was only in 1954 under the Special Marriage Act, Hindu Special Marriage Act, that Hindus were only permitted to marry one wife. Before that, they could marry as many as they want. So even though when it became illegal from 1954 for Hindu women to marry more than one wife, yet from 1951 to 61, the Hindus were involved with more polygamous marriages as compared to Muslims. So basically, according to all the other religions, you can marry as many as you wish. But in Islam, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, number 3, marry a woman of a choice in twos, threes or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. So this statement, marry only one, is only given in the Quran and no other, no other religious scripture. The Quran says, marry a woman of a choice in twos, threes or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. And Quran further says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 29, verse number 129, that it is difficult for man to do justice between his eyes. But do not turn away from them altogether. I mean, do not neglect them altogether. As well, you know, keeping them, hanging them in the air. So here the Quranic verse says it's difficult to be for a man to be just between his wife. But don't turn away from them altogether. That means if you marry more than one wife, you can marry two, three or maximum five. But see to it you do justice. If you can't do justice, you should not marry. And it says that marrying more, doing justice is difficult. So in the ruling of Islam, there are five categories. Something which is fard compulsory, something which is mustab that is encouraged, something which is muba, which is permissible or optional, something which is makrut discouraged, and last is something which is haram prohibited. So many of the non-Muslims think marrying more than one wife is compulsory. Some know it's not compulsory. It would be in the MOBA category or the optional category. Many people think in India that you know 80% of the Muslims marry more than one wife. They marry four wives. It's totally wrong. In fact, in India, as I told you, the percentage is only 4%. And in Malaysia, it may be a little bit more. In the Gulf countries also, what's the percentage? If you do a survey, some of the countries, 10% of the Muslim men have more, more than one wife. 15, some may be 20%. On an average, if you look at, there are more than 2 billion Muslims in the world. The average of Muslims marrying more than one wife will surely be in single digit. Would be less than 10%. So it's a misconception that majority of the Muslims marry more than one wife. It's wrong. Majority, more than 90% have only one wife. Less than 10% have more than one wife. Let us analyze what is the logic that Islam has given permission for some of the Muslim men to marry more than one wife. By nature, men and women, male and female, should be born on an equal proportion. But unfortunately, if we analyze the ratio of the sex ratio at birth, most of the countries in the world, the male are born more as compared to the females. Why? Because science and technology has advanced. Even in the advanced country like USA, for every, for every thousand female born, there are five males born more at birth. So for every thousand female born, 1,005 male are born. Why? Even though it's an advanced country, yet they prefer having male children than females. So most of the country, the male are born more. But in some of the country, the ratio is drastically different. And India is one of the countries where there was an article that came in Al Jazeera in 2015 that every day in India, 7,000 fetuses are either being aborted 
of females after they are born are being killed. Every day in India alone, more than 7,000 female fetuses are being aborted or female children are being killed after they are born. If you multiply this figure by 365, the number of days, more than two and a half million females every year in India are either aborted before they are born or immediately after they are born they are being killed. And India has the second largest population in the world. And very shortly it will even overtake China. According to the World Factbook, the Worldometer, India today has 1.399 billion people living. Some statistics say it has even crossed China. China today has about 1.42 billion people living. Within very shortly, within a few months, India will overtake. Some statistics have said India is already overtaking China. China again, at birth, there are more females, there are less females as compared to male. So India and China put together, they constitute 35% of the world population. India is close to 1.4 billion, China has 1.4 billion. So 2.8 billion out of 8 billion is 35% of the world population. And if in these two countries, if female feticide and female infanticide is stopped, the world population of females will be much more as compared to males. Today, today in spite in USA, males being born more. Today medical science tells us that the female child can fight the germs and diseases better than the male child. So in the pediatric age itself, there are more male children dying as compared to female children. As life goes on, there are deaths due to cigarette smoking, death due to cigarette smoking, death due to alcoholism, death due to diseases. There are more male dying as compared to female. Deaths are due to war. So in all these cases, there are more male dying as compared to female. So because of this, because the female is medically a stronger sex, the female has better immunity as compared to male. And males are dying more as compared to in alcoholism, in cigarette smoking, in wars, etc. The female lives longer than male. Today, the average lifespan of a male is 68.9 years old. In different countries it varies, Japan it is more, other parts of the world it's less. But the average of the full world is, males on average live for 68.9 years old and females live for 74.9 years old. In Japan, the age of a female is more than 60, something 87 and male is 82, but average of the full world. So females on average live 5 years more than males. Percentage-wise, the females live 7% more than the males. In spite of this, that the males are born more in USA because of ultrasonography, modern method, even though it's an advanced country, yet people prefer having males more than males. Not as much as India, but yet. According to statistics of 2015, according to the World Factbook, according to CIA, in USA alone, there were 4.8 million females more than males. In New York alone, there were half million females more than males. In Germany alone, there was 1.2 million females more than males. In Bangladesh alone, in 2015, towards the end of the year, there were 4.2 million females more than males. In Russia alone, there were 10.2 million females more than males. In European Union, of all the 28 countries put together, in 2015, there were 10 million females more than male in these 28 European countries. And God knows how many millions are more than males all over the world. But because some countries, female infanticide and family planning is there, and two most populated countries, India and Pakistan, sorry, India and China, in these two countries alone, at the birth rate, at the time of birth, the females are very few as compared to male. Maybe 8% less, 10% less or much more. But by the time that the end before, 
the latest statistics says in 2023, when Indian population is 1.399 million, 6% females, 6% males are more than female. At birth, there may be 8, 10 or 12% female less. But since female outgrow the male, the average 6% males are more than females. That means there may be 84 million approximately females less than the males in India and a similar number or a bigger number may be in China. So in these two countries, so now if we see the average percentage of male and female is approximately the same. But if this evil act in India and China stop, there will be hundreds of millions more than males hundreds of millions of females more than women throughout the world. As of today, as we know, this was statistics of 2015, that 4.8 million females are more than males. Some statistics today say there are 10 million females more than males in US alone. So if suppose my sister or your sister happens to be living in USA, and she happens to be one of the 4.8 million females in 2015 or maybe one of the 10 million females in USA today who has not found a life partner. So the only option for her is that she either marries a man who already has a wife or becomes public property. Some people may say public property, Dr. Zakir, you are using such a harsh word. I said it is the most sophisticated word I can use. You either marry a man who already has a wife or become public property. In USA, it's common on an average, a man before settling with a wife, he has on an average eight different sexual partners. Some may have two, some may have ten, some may have twenty. On an average, an American before he settles down, before he marries a woman, he has eight different sexual partners. After he married, how many he has is not mentioned in the statistics. So in USA, having girlfriends and mistresses is common. 5, 10, 20, no problem. But having more than one legal wife, it cannot go down their throat. It's not legal. Now when you have mistresses, 5 or 10 mistresses, the woman is not protected. A woman is a mistress. A woman who is a mistress of a man, she doesn't have legal rights. She is not protected, she is dishonored, she is looked down upon, she doesn't get her rights, she is humiliated. On the other hand, if a wife is the second wife of a man, she gets protected, she gets her legal rights, she gets inheritance, she is honored, she is looked up with respect. So which is better? So but natural, a good human being who is modest, a woman, if she has these two choices, should she marry a man who already has a husband? Should she marry a man who already has a wife or become public property? She would choose the first one. It's logical. So this is one of the major, re one of the reasons that Islam has permitted a man to have more than one wife as long as it has justice. But there are various other reasons. I'll just mention a few more. Suppose a man has married a wife and they cannot conceive. So what's the option? If you cannot marry, you'll have to divorce her and then marry a new wife and then have children. If you want to have children. In Islam, if a woman cannot bear children, it's not her fault. What he can do, he can keep her and take another wife from which he can have children. And if a woman wants to have child and she cannot have child and if the husband marries another wife and have children, so one of the other reasons is that if they cannot bear children, then very well, he doesn't have to divorce the first wife. He can keep her first wife, who is good otherwise, and marry another wife and have children. There can be a case, maybe after marriage, within a few months, the wife may have accident. And then she cannot do, do the role of a wife. She may not be able to sexually satisfy her because of the accident. So in this case, what he can do? He cannot live without having sexual relationship. So if he cannot marry a second wife, he'll have to divorce her. Imagine now she has a problem, 
she had accident it's no fault of hers and to divorce her so in islam what he can do he can keep the first wife and marry a second wife in this case the second wife will satisfy the sexual needs and yet he maintains the first wife and looks after both equally there can be a case that the wife may have some medical illness may have some sickness in which she cannot sexually satisfy the husband so in this case he doesn't have to divorce her he can keep her and marry another wife and both can be wife of the person and he get the sexual satisfaction here he takes care of the first wife so there are various reasons that islam has permitted a man to have more than one wife and all of these are logical reasons so islam is a practical way of life it's a practical religion that's the reason islam has the solution to the problems of human kind and today one of the problem is that women are more in the world and islam has the solution that doesn't mean everyone has more than one wife there's a small percentage which is more and this evil practice of it stops <coughs> of female infanticide and female fetishism the women in the world will be in hundreds of millions so in this case where there's a requirement a man can have more than one wife and as for well as they follow the sharia rules and islam is the most practical religion hope this answers the question and this was the last answer that we could give to the question inshallah till we meet again after two weeks as i mentioned on the 29th of july inshallah i'll be handling the ask dr zakir the 11th season session number 2 till then till we meet i'd like to wish assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and wa akhir dawan alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin